Our next, uh, our next speaker this afternoon is Keelan Overton, who is the curator of Islamic art at the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. Uh, her research interests include early modern Persian and Indian painting, Persian ceramics and tile work, and histories of collecting. Her dissertation was on the book arts during the reign of Ibrahim II in the Deccan. Her paper today is called Patterns of Revivalism, the Safavid Pahlavi case study through a pan-Islamic lens. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Navina, and thank you also to Sheila and Julia and the program committee for organizing this really wonderful conference. I have personally already been inspired by many of the papers that were presented yesterday and this morning. Um, they've inspired me to look differently, actually, at the material that I'm going to show you now. So thank you for those inspirations. The historiography of American contributions to Persian art history is generally dominated by Arthur Upham Pope, who has inspired a tome of positive and very negative criticism. That in the former category often praises his architectural photography, particularly the approximately 250 plates bearing his name in volume five, Islamic Architecture, of the 1938 Survey of Persian Art. Some of Pope's best survey images had earlier been exhibited across the globe, and in 1948, he donated 99 large-scale prints to Harvard. While Pope deserves credit for his photographic efforts, he was certainly not alone. According to Rexford Steed, Pope's co-adventurers in this regard included, quote, Stephen Nyman and Donald Wilbur, Eric Schroeder, Frau Drillal Basel, and Robert Byron. The latter four individuals are well known in the historiography of Persian art, and their names appear regularly in the credit lines of the survey. By contrast, less is known of Nyman, whose name is not associated with a single survey plate and whose Archnet legacy is, includes just one building that he shot in the 1970s. It is, in fact, Stephen H. Nyman who left one of the most transparent, comprehensive, and accessible records of the American Institute for Iranian Art and Archaeology's efforts in Iran just prior to and during World War II. Nyman stands behind the camera of many of the fieldwork photographs of Pope and associates and surveyors of Persian art, and this particular co-adventurer was also resp responsible for expanding the scope of the Institute's documentation from just photography alone to both photography and film. The fruits of Nyman's efforts as a videographer are these three films. So we have uh, Iran, the New Persia, which is essentially a travelogue of the country. These are all about 20 minutes each. The Art of Persia focuses on four crafts, or handicrafts, as Pope and Nyman called them. And Weaving a Persian Rug is about carpet making. Nyman's films are rare records of the cultural climate, the urban landscapes, the conditions of monuments, uh, artistic production, during the reign of Reza Shah, and to a lesser extent, the opening ones of his successor. The majority of the footage was shot between 1937 and 42, but Nyman's finished films weren't copyrighted and circulated by the Asia Institute until 1947. Near the end of his life, Nyman began gifting his photographic archive to Harvard, a collection that now comprises 585 color slides, 730 black and white color film negatives, and 172 black and white photographic prints. And temporally, it covers over four decades from 1937 until 1979. Nyman's photographs are characterized by an ethnographic, contextual, and at times raw quality. We sense that he shot rapidly, capturing pretty much anything and everything he could, including people. And I should clarify here that these shots are my study shots of color slides on a light box. Uh, Harvard is in the process of scanning all these, so I apologize for the blurry quality. Uh, whereas Pope tended to photograph fine art in a fine arts fashion, if you will, Nyman often emphasized the context and production behind a work of art which is one reason why uh, his images are going to be, prove quite useful, I think. 
A central goal of my paper today is to summarize Nyman's efforts in Iran between 1937 and 42, and to position his archive as a resource for both historiographic and material-based scholarship of the future. Additionally, I examine Nyman's documentation of three forms of revivalism during the early Pahlavi period, uh, the construction of modernist buildings partially inspired by Iran's pre-Islamic past, the restoration of iconic Safavid monuments, and the creation of um, new crafts, uh, as I'm again call them, inspired by traditional materials, techniques, and composition. So here I'm defining revivalism broadly as any form of artistic uh, activity deliberately in conversation with those of the past. All three strands of these, all three of these strands of revivalism impacted the art collection and home of American philanthropist Doris Duke, who died in 1993. Uh, her home and collection is now owned and operated by the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, or DBFIA. As this slide illustrates, revivalism is a key component of the DDFIA collection, and at the end of this paper, I will examine some of these works of art uh, in relation to Pope and Nyman's global purveying efforts of the 1930s. Stephen Nyman was born in 1909 in Washington, D.C., and received his BA in Commerce, which is key, from George Washington, and MS in Business, which is also key, from Columbia. His earliest exposure to Iran occurred during his three-year tenure in the New York City department store B. Altman & Company, where he worked in the Oriental Rugs Department. In March of 1936, he decided to take his interest in Persian rugs to the next level. His resume explains, quote, I left Altman and Company to go to Iran and make a motion picture of Persian rug weaving, seeing such film as good business and wanting to learn more about the subject at first hand. An accident in Germany stopped me and I spent the winter in Italy, returning to the US in March of 1937. Soon thereafter, Nyman met Pope and quote, on learning that I still had a camera in color film, he invited me to join his institute's 1937 expedition to Iran, which I did. During the eighth season, 1937, of the architectural survey, Nyman filmed and photographed monuments in Isfahan, Tehran, Mashhad, that's Hans and Tabriz, and, uh, among other places. His invitation to participate in the eighth season was fortuitous, for it coincided with the expedition being granted, quote, constant access to the shrine area of Imam Reza. Since this documentation was gathered at the end of the season, so in the fall of 37, it wasn't included in the survey, which only features images of the mosque of Gohar Shad. Nyman's public record of the Institute's Mashad firsts can be found in two forms, his film, Iran the New Persia, and this article, Filming in the New Iran. In the latter, he boasted, quote, I filmed the tomb of the greatest saint of Shia Muhammad. I filmed it in color, shooting between the protecting bars and using a wide angle lens to get the whole of the tomb in the picture. Although circumstances were far from ideal, I got a satisfactory color picture of the tomb and nobody has done that before. Now, despite this immodest account, his film falls a bit short. Uh, like the survey, it focuses on the exterior of the mosque of Gohar Shad, and it only includes a brief shot of the steel zari in the tomb chamber. We can conclude with relative confidence that the raw footage shot by Nyman in 1937 was censored for the final film circulated by the Asia Institute in 1947, and I'll return to this issue of censorship in a moment. So in contrast to his censored film, uh, Nyman's photographs preserved at Harvard are transparent records of the 1937 Mashhad expedition. Approximately 30 color slides are included in the M5 series, and some capture furnishings and works of art, doors, tiles, the zari, that have since been removed to the shrine museum or completely replaced. As such, they are valuable visual records of a particular moment in the history of an ever-evolving and living shrine complex. So as an aside, I understand that um, Adola Gujani is working on a monograph right now um, about Mashhad, and of course we have several um, colleagues in the audience today who are experts in Ilkhan and Luster work, um, so I leave it to you all to decide the value of this archive. I do think it 
or at least I hope it does have something to offer. Uh, nine photographs were taken inside the tomb chamber. This sh one shows the outer steel zari, which is notable for its lack of an arcade and simplicity in relation to a later replacement. The remaining eight, four of which you see here, focus on the Ilkhanid tilework decorating the tomb's walls, including a lengthy inscription frieze above the dado and two luster mihrabs, one signed by Abu Zaid and dated 612, 1215, and the other likely contemporary. In 1937, little was known about the tomb chamber, at least in English-speaking art historical circles. Only these two photographs had been published in an Ars Islamica article, and the author had this to say about the two luster mihrabs on the south wall. Quote, the other one, meaning the Abu Zaid, which I've circled, is so close to the tomb that it was impossible to photograph it without standing with one's back toward the imam, which of course would be out of the question. Uh, besides the photograph of the sanctuary reproduced in a 1976 publication, Nyman's 1930 images are, as far as I know, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the only known color photographs of the sanctuary with the mihrabs in situ. In contrast to the 1976 image, Nyman takes us to the other side of the Abu Zaid, the area that is also completely obscured behind the Zari in the 1935 photograph. In a second image, Nyman focuses on the Abu Zaid, and despite being slightly washed out, or perhaps this is just my own fault <laughs> with my photograph, again, of a color slide, it captures its overall fine condition to include its intact lower edge prior to the raising of the floor. So note that. Nyman's final two images are a partial view of the circus 1215 mihrab, revealing a frieze of molded turquoise tiles once above its upper edge, and a zoomed in shot of the dado to the right of the Abu Zaid. So before I move on, I just want to thank Sheila Blair and Oliver Watson for their thoughts on this material. Uh, during the 1937 season, Nyman returned to the dream that had sparked his interest in Iran in the first place to make a film about carpets or carpet production. Now this interest in carpets quickly transferred to other visual arts. He also turned his lens towards printed cotton textiles, khatam khari woodwork, mosaic tile, and miniature painting. This footage, combined with some he gathered in 1939, was ultimately edited into his film, The Art of Persia, the commercial and political motivations of which cannot be overstated. So note, for example, um, the list of sponsors, including many, many members of the Society for National Heritage. Now, the purpose of the film was twofold to bolster sales for Iran's burgeoning export trade of contemporary craft, and to underscore the Pahlavi regime's commitment to achieving balance between modernist efforts of the present and the artistic accomplishments of Iran's past. The latter is exemplified by Nyman's statement in this section devoted to miniature painting, quote, the Persians are making resolute and intelligent efforts to revive and modernize their ancient arts. Here in the National Fine Arts School in Tehran, talented students are taught modern portraiture and landscape painting. They are also put through the discipline of painting miniatures in the Persian manner. Hossein Bezad is next singled out as, quote, remarkable at doing portraits in the 17th century style. He works with the speed of a modern charcoal caricaturist. For the Pahlavi regime, Hossein Bezad represented the contemporary ideal. He created new work in styles and techniques of Iran's medieval and early modern past, and of course, all the while while wearing a suit. In addition to documenting revivalism in Tehran's art schools, Nyman explored how the genre concurrently shaped the city's streets. At the beginning of Iran, the New Persia, he describes Tehran as, quote, a modern city compared to what it was two decades ago, a reality thanks to the modernization efforts of the late racist Shah. So again, remember that the film is copyrighted in 1947. 
The city now boasts, quote, wide tree-lined avenues of asphalt, a reference to the orthogonal grills, grids imposed during Reza Shah's reign, and a number of modern buildings, those rendered in the international style. While Nyman is dismissive of buildings like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which, quote, do not make use of Iran's own rich architectural tradition, he praises those that incorporate pre-Islamic quotations, including the National Museum, police headquarters, and the Banque Meli. While Nyman documented the neo, which we've heard about a lot today, revivalist discourse of Tehran, he also filmed and photographed the Safavid monuments of Isfahan that Pope had identified as the most worthy of global purveying, including the Masjid Shah and Masjid Sheikh Lutfala. His record confirms a well-known fact. Tile work requires continual repair, while shedding further light upon the restoration efforts of the early Pahlavi period. At the time of Nyman's first visit in 1937, repairs to Esfahan's Safavid tile work was well underway. Pope had included photographs of the restoration of the dome of the Madrasea Chahar Bagh in a 1931 article. And between 1935 and 36, the dome of the Masjid Sheikh Lutfala was restored as documented by Smith, who also amassed a wonderful archive. Nyman's visit in 1937 coincided with the repair of the Masjid Shah's mosaic dome. As was typical, he focused on recording each step in the artistic process, the drawing of the design, the cutting of the individual bricks, and the arrangement of the fragments face down on a template erected in the winter prayer hall. In addition to documenting the restoration of the mosque's dome, Nyman also photographed the dilapidated state of its entrance portal particularly its pair of large mosaic panels. The lower half of the left pan panel appears to have been restored with Hofrangi square tiles, while the lower fourth of the right panel, nearly a fourth of the composition, is lost. And on the upper right, I'm showing you Pope's earlier photograph of the panels, which again gives you an, a sense of how muddled they were. Note how the border is thrown across here, which is about two and a half feet taller than the panel that we, um, higher than the panel that we see today. A year after Nyman's 1937 visit, these canonical panels were filmed by yet another individual associated with Pope's Institute, James Cromwell, the husband of Doris Duke, then Doris Duke Cromwell. In January of 1938, the Cromwells had become lifetime members of Pope's Institute, at the time, they were finishing the construction of their Honolulu home known as Shangri-La. This home and the collection of Persian art preserved inside of it are tangible reflections of the revivalist language espoused by the, uh, the Society for National Heritage and globally pervaded by Pope and Nyman during the early 20th century. Elsewhere, I've traced how Shangri-La's modernist architecture fused with Achmed-inspired quotations constitutes a rare contemporary expression of Tehran's neo-discourse on foreign soil. Yet another concrete legacy of early Pahlavi revivalism at Shangri-La is the property's large corpus of tile work, the majority of which was modeled after revetment on the masjid shah At least two components of this tile work can be linked to Nyman. First, in advance of the Cromwell's Iran trip, Pope provided James Cromwell with detailed technical advice about filming and photographing in the country. As confirmed by this telegram, Pope had received this up-to-date know-how from Nyman, who had just arrived in Berlin after the 1937 expedition. Had it not been for Nyman's trailblazing efforts in Iran the year prior, it is doubtful that Cromwell's documentation, which includes detailed photographs like these, and over 20 minutes of color film shot in Isfahan, Mashhad, and the Caspian Sea region would have been nearly as successful. In addition to Nyman's technical advice, James Cromwell also benefited from his own fortuitous timing. His efforts transpired literally just weeks before the Iranian cabinet passed regulations governing taking motion picture films and photographs, painting, and drawing which among many, many other things stipulated, filming anything that is inconsistent with the interest, prestige, and dignity of the country is absolutely forbidden. 
Given his good timing, it is not surprising that Cromwell's footage is far more detailed than what we see in Nyman's censored 1947 film. In the shrine of Imam Reza, while his wife was accompanied by a large group, James Cromwell spent a great deal of time filming in the old court, including the Iran of Ali Shir Nawai, which was ex excluded from Nyman's film. So again, recall that Nyman's film only shows the Moscow Gohar Shad. Cromwell's Caspian Sea segment further suggests that he just averted the heavy handedness of the May 1938 regulations. His documentation of the rural poor stands in sharp contrast to the suit wearing moderns in Nyman's films. The most tangible connection between Nyman and the Cromwells can be found in this segment in The Art of Persia, in which he shows the final steps in production of the large mosaic panel being made for Doris Duke Cromwell's Hawaiian palace. Pope was likely thrilled by this commission, which saw Safavid revivalism realized on American soil in a manner that far surpassed his own efforts in London in 1931. The tile commissions were far from the sole examples of Safavid revivalist art acquired by the Cromwells in the 1930s. The couple also purchased a number of works of art of the type lauded by Nyman in the art of Persia, including small Khatamkhari boxes with Safavid style figural painting and single page paintings, including one example signed by Hussein Bezad. It's very nice, yep. this one. Um, concurrent to their interest in Persian revivalism, the Cromwells also patronized similar modes of production in India and Morocco. During their honeymoon in India, they commissioned carved and inlaid marble work inspired by Mughal prototypes in Agra and Delhi, a subject recently examined in depth by Talia Kennedy. And here I'm showing a part of her paper where she links the exact designs at Shangri-La with their specific prototypes in buildings in Agra and Delhi. In 1937, the year before they went to Iran, the Cromwells commissioned a firm in Rabat to oversee the creation of balustrades, screens, ceiling, doors, and windows for Shangri-La, the majority of which were inspired by 14th through 17th century prototypes. The Shangri-La commissions, coupled with contemporary projects in France, Spain, and India, among other places, I could add many of the things that we've heard about yesterday and this morning, beg the questions, to what extent can we speak of pan-Islamic revivalism during the 1920s and 30s, and what circumstances fused to create this climate of revivalism. Incidentally, a similar mode of revivalism, in this case motivated by the experience of architectural, our architectural space is shaping museum experience today. I would like to conclude by briefly commenting on some future avenues of research. It seems possible that concrete le links can be made between the restoration of Safavid Isfahani monuments in the 1930s and the creation of the custom-made tile work for Shangri-La in 1938-39. When Nyman's 1937 archive is added to this existing mix of evidence, we move even closer to learning more about the tile industry of the early Pahlavi period. And again, I need to offer an aside because I met someone yesterday, Mr. Mohammed Motagi, who's already given me quite a lot of information on, on these artisans and workshops, and it seems very likely that we will know quite a bit more about them in the coming weeks, months. Uh, so the questions that we perhaps need to ask uh, are, do we indeed care to learn about, more about this recent era of production? And does it have any real impact on our field? And I would argue that yes, we should care, and yes, it does um, have an impact, if only for the fact that the mosaic masterpiece upstairs was touched by the hands of skilled Pahlavi ceramists. Now turning to the portable object, Mary McWilliams has explored the survey's impact on the formation of the collection of Norma Jean Calderwood to include some examples of Minai that had been heavily restored in Paris workshops in the 20s. So here again, we re re return to Pope, his inner circle, and the Duke collection, for we know that Ayub Rabineau uh, operated a store in Paris. The dealer sold Duke these two forgeries in 1938, as well 
as um, at the same time that he was overseeing the creation of her, of her custom-made tile work. And Nyman contributed to the global purveying of Minai in the art of Persia. We may then wonder about points of intersection between these two modes of ceramic production. In terms of the ceramic arts, the products of early Pahlavi period revivalism are mixed. We are dealing with the really good, the bad in terms of restoration, and if I'm gonna be bold, the ugly. Um, but regardless of our criteria of judgment, two things seem clear. First, the historiography of Persian art has much to gain from a consideration of Pope's associates, not just the ultimate purveyor himself. And here I'm simply underscoring Talin Gugor's emphasis from several years ago. And secondly, there is a great deal to learn about this critical period of canon formation, not just from surveyors, but from primary sources preserved in archives in York, Washington, Cambridge, and Honolulu. Thank you.